We are on. recording. We what are time recording. is it? Just out of curiosity. It is 11.39. Okay, not too bad. Nope. And so far, you're the only one here. And it's Reem and oh, Regina is here. is coming. Mm -hmm. Hi, Regina. That's okay. I just have to catch my breath anyway. Let's, hi. <laughs> here it is, <laughs> the 1st of July. Halfway through. And um, we have a question from last time from somebody about, is it okay to mulch blueberries and raspberries? Yes, yes, yes. But here's how we do it. All right. I got to make notes. Oh, you can take notes. Sorry. <laughs> um, blueberries are very much an acid lover. Acid, acid, acid. Probably at least a pH of five. Mm. So if you have access to pine needles, Okay. Although, Rima, I have recently heard, and, you know, traditions die, die so hard that um, you got to turn that off. It is. Okay. I, um, I would, I always use pine needles because the theory was as they broke down, they would help keep the soil acid or even acidify it. Okay. Now I've heard that maybe that's not true. So that is something everybody should look up on their own. Re modern research, recent, last three, four, five years, because understandings do change. Sometimes, you know how it goes in the old days, what we call, why do we call it old wives tale? I don't, we should change that. Mm -hmm. um, become the rule and nobody questions it after a while. Right. You know? Okay. And then it becomes tradition. And then finally, somebody gets around to actually researching it and discovers it's not true. Mm -hmm. So, whatever you have for mulch, remember blueberries are very shallow rooted. And so, you really don't want to be, want to be clomping around, especially if the ground is wet, right around where your blueberries are, if you can manage it. Okay. Um, I would say a good three to four inches of something kind of fluffy. You don't want it to mat down because then of course the water just runs off. Just hang on a second, Regina. Um, so I always use a mixture of leaves in my white pine needles uh, about, and I replenish them every fall a good three inches deep. I hardly ever have any weeds around my blueberries. Mm. Quick question, Regina, on this topic. Can't you check your pH before you do that? Well, of course you should. <laughs> yes, always. Yep. Unless so you happen, the... if you happen to have blueberries or other acid-loving plants growing well there, then you don't have to because obviously they wouldn't be doing that if the pH wasn't correct. So what would the pH, desirable pH be for blueberries? A good five, at least. They're quite acid Acidic. loving. Five or lower. Yeah, well, not too much lower, but a four or five would be okay. But I do. I think mine's about five, and they're fine. So, if the leaves start turning yellow, chances are you're not getting enough of the iron because it's tied up at the higher pH. Okay. So, yeah. All right. Uh, raspberries. Now you have to be a little more careful because they are, their roots are more sensitive to damp soil mm -hmm. so either plant your raspberries on higher ground and or sloping ground um, or a raised bed so that they have good drainage but i tend to only mulch the same mixture for me um mowed up leaves and pine needles topping um maybe two in keep it at two inches and once again once you do that you don't have I hardly ever weed the raspberry patch. So is that satisfied the question from whenever that was we did mulching? So raspberries like, they have a pH also, they like more acidic soil as well. Uh, yes, but not as extreme. Okay. I'm, I'm thinking raspberries will get by on even a six, five, okay. down to a six or so. Yeah, they're not as sensitive. All right. All right. Okay. Yes. Oh, yeah. so here's what? kind of an odd question. An odd question. <laughs> that has to do with that. Pine needles. Oh, yeah. So there are the long pine needles uh -huh. and there are the short little bitty pine needles. Yeah. Does it matter which kind you use? No, not really. Except the, the, the long ones tend to be soft. The short ones tend to be prickly. Yes. It's easier to rake up okay. the long ones than the short ones. Okay. But what you know what it is. Whatever you have, 
It's better than nothing. Okay. Any ideas? Okay. Also, now, because I live on a windy hill, um, I put my mowed leaves down first and then just lightly sprinkle okay. the long pine needles on top and they tend to hold it in place. Okay. Super. Thank you. Yeah, this was a dual question. Uh, the blueberries for me and the raspberries for somebody else. So I have to write it out for her. Okay. Just, you know, um, just another, before we get going on our bug topic today, leaves are different. Some leaves, such as oak leaves, tend to curl up as they dry. Uh, birch leaves are fairly small to begin with. Right. So are red maples fairly small. To, not red maples, uh, Japanese red maples. Oh, yes. Are fair, so if you get those leaves, you probably don't have to mow them because they'll curl up or be small to begin with. But if you have maple leaves, like I do, sugar maples, red maples, they stay flat. Okay. And so put them on the paths or maybe in your shrub border, but I wouldn't put them on top of your raspberries be, or your daffodil row like I did the first year, years ago, because up come the daffodils and the flat maple leaves matted down yes. two inches, keep, stay on as a top hat and the poor daffodils yes. get bent over. And anyway, so you have to mow the maple leaves and any others that would be like that. I don't know because I don't have those, but okay. there's some, some that curl and some that don't. Okay. Super. All righty. Now, today's topic is twofold. So, and we have to move along. We're a little late in getting started. My fault. I got here late. Um, we're going to talk mainly about bugs. That's, that's like jello. It's a general term that includes certain kind of worms, nematodes, spiders, um, slugs, all those creatures that we have decided are not, we don't want in our garden. So I call them bugs. <laughs> Alrighty. And then we're going to talk briefly about watering at the end because we have hit a dry spell mm -hmm. and we need to do some watering. <clears throat> okay. How to begin here. Um, so many Americans after the Second World War, when pesticides became popular and plentiful and relatively cheap, went that route for dealing with a problem in the garden. But the problem, there's at least two problems with that. And um, one is of all the stuff out there, and I'm gonna just label them bugs. At the most 10% are harmful to us in our garden. And I think at this point, I should say everything is relative. Some people talk about, and they're actually working on it. <coughs> Let's get rid of all the mosquitoes in the world. Yeah. Who needs mosquitoes? We don't. Right. But we do. Because think of the birds. Mm -hmm. Think of the lizards. Bats. Bats. Yeah, I forgot about the bats. Because so many of them have died off. Um, if you think of life here on Earth as a huge tapestry, this gorgeous tapestry made up of hundreds of different threads all woven together and one of those threads is the mosquito <laughs> and you don't like it relative we don't like it so you eliminate that thread and maybe there's one or two other things you don't like uh, the woodchucks bang 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 or poison poison and you eliminate the woodchucks and har hornets and hornets we, we could make a long list, couldn't we? <laughs> However, what's going to start to happen? The tapestry won't be able to stay as nice as it was. It could totally fall apart, yeah. the tapestry. Yes. So we have to be very careful what we pull and eliminate. All right? Um, just let them know that they're on the air, okay? Yeah. Um, we're here in the library and sometimes folks come, sometimes little folks, and they don't realize they're going to be in the cloud forever. So we have to let them know that. So where do you get this 10% from? It's a ballpark figure. I read it somewhere or heard it somewhere. 
it could be 5%, it could be 15%, I don't know, but it's about 10%. Because so many of these things that live in the ground, mostly, and then in the air, um, we don't even see them. So how can you count them? So getting back to the spray, if you, as many people used to do, spray indiscriminately, you kill everything there, the good guys as well as the bad guys. And bug zappers too. Huh? Bug zappers also. Okay, bug zappers also. So that's one problem. You're killing off your friends who could help you with the problem as well as the enemy. The second problem, which we're beginning to realize, although doctors have warned of it for a decade or two or three, TB is coming back because of all the antibiotics, which in a sense are another type of spray that we gladly take at the light, slightest possible whatever we have. Mm -hmm. Give me an antibiotic. Mm -hmm. And they did. And now the bugs, we can't actually say they're smart, but somehow built in to the DNA of all things that have sex, the offspring are always slightly varied than their parents. They're not clones. And so you take an antibiotic long enough, there's gonna be a handful of whatever it is you're trying to kill off in your body that becomes resistant. Mm -hmm. All the others of their relatives die off, leaving the population resistant to your antibodies which is why we're having trouble now with like measles, a small, well, no, we got rid of smallpox. Um, yes. Yeah. TB, isn't it? Is a, a thing. TB is something that would be affected by that. Oh yeah. It's coming back too. Um, or you just go to the hospital nowadays and we're, we're going off on a tangent here, but um, there are many, I'm going to call them resistant bugs that cause infections. And then all of a sudden your antibiotic does biotic doesn't work. Right. They have to figure out a stronger one, a different one. And they're beginning to have problems, as mm -hmm. we know, if you pay attention to the news. Okay, but to back to our bugs, um, either we kill them all off, our friends as well as the bad guys, and then some of them become resistant and you have to buy a stronger poison. So, and once again, that thought, it's all relative. If you spray your lawn with both an herbicide to get rid of weeds and an insecticide to get rid of any of the grubs, then you wonder, how come I don't have my robin come, come April hopping around the lawn? There's nothing there for the robin to eat, worms in, in particular. And so what you have created with your lawn, which we'll talk about maybe in a month or so, we'll do a whole session on the lawn, you have a desert. So... The cautionary tale is if you have to spray, and sometimes I think you do have to, read the directions and do the least amount that you have to and do it at a certain time frame. Um, something if you study bugs, usually they're not there all summer long. They have a season. Mm -hmm. For instance, the Japanese beetles haven't shown up yet, but pretty soon in a week or maybe two, they will, and they'll be around for four to six weeks, the adult beetle. Mm -hmm. So there's no use spraying for Japanese beetles in April because they're not out and about. They're still down in the lawn and you're as a grub. So know your bugs, know the spray. If you're using a spray spray rather than granular, don't do it when the wind's gonna blow it in your face or if you live in town, across the fence into your neighbor's garden, all right? So you have to be responsible. All righty, what if you don't wanna use sprays? So what do you do? Well, um, it takes time and it takes dedication. It's part, become a part of your lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And I call it the Dawn Patrol. <laughs> now, I think when this program is over, I'm going to have Rima look up in Magic Land. I think back in the late 30s, there was a movie called The Dawn Patrol with <laughs> Earl Flynn. And it was a World War I movie. And he was a pilot in one of these by wings with his, you know, in the old days, they were out in the cold air, helmet, goggles, scarf. And I, I'm assuming he was battling the Germans. I don't remember the movie very well. 
but you can think of it as the dawn patrol you against them and you have to realize there are a lot more of them <laughs> than there are of us but we tend to be smarter <laughs> but you have to be persistent so what i say is early in the morning why early in the morning and i mean early about the time the sun comes up why we why why should we do that rima why can't i go out at 10 11 in the morning to hunt bugs they're active in the morning no bugs like lizards and snakes and toads and frogs and all are cold-blooded so oh, they're inactive. They're sort of inactive if the dawn is if the night is chilly. They they can't hop as fast or fly as fast. So early in the morning, you patrol when it's cool and they are slow. Now, <laughs> did you hunt up those pictures I asked for, Rima? I think you must have. Yes. They're right there. Okay, so can we put on? <laughs> we're gonna see. have actual pictures for you all, all to see. We hope. Or you can look at them. You can look at them after. Okay, while she's hunting, I'll start in. Um, I'm going, okay, first of all, I'm only going to deal with half a dozen or so that I have come across in my garden here in Allegheny County. I'm sure some of you elsewhere have had others, but if that's the case, you'll have to look them up because I don't know about the others. I'm not an etymologist, is that the word? Expert. The first to appear are the asparagus beetles. So if you have an asparagus bed and they're fairly early, usually by May and oh no, by June, when your asparagus stalks are up and you're cutting them to eat. And then in early July, when they start to fern out, you just let them grow. And they're easy to spot. They're not very long. Oh, there's one. They're only about, I'm thinking a quarter inch to a third inch long. And as you can see, they're reddish with tiny little spots, but they're easy to spot against the green foliage. And oh, now, come on guys, you can't be squeamish. I just squish them with my fingers. If you're squeamish, put on a pair of gloves um, and you walk down your asparagus row and you spot them. Usually I don't see more than three or four or five in a morning. And this goes on for about, I don't know, three, four weeks. So squish, squish, squish. I have an interesting story. I think I told you, Rima, maybe last week or something about the asparagus beetles. You know, just because they're bugs and they're little, and they have tiny brains, <laughs> does not mean they're dumb. Because the first two or three days, I caught most of them. Every now and again, you'd bump the stalk and they'd, they'd instantly drop down into the litter and disappear. But by the third morning, they had learned. The survivors had learned. And somehow they had communicated that to all the others that were hatching out because as I came down the row, they started falling off before I got there. And I thought, that's weird. <laughs> they have learned I'm the predator. Get out of sight. So then it became a little harder to get them. But they're easy to keep under control. Um, something that's less easy and more time consuming um, was the Colorado potato beetle. Now, some of you know, I live pretty isolated. However, in the early days, 25, 30 years ago, Kent's potato farm was only like three miles down the road. Oh, it's striped. Why did I think it was spotted? I'm glad you found that because I didn't remember. It's been years since I've seen one. That's the Colorado potato beetle? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Striped, not spotted. And sort of a coppery color with some light colored stripes and and once again mm, third of an inch long maybe and they will decimate your potatoes if they get out of control which is why potato potatoes have a lot of problems which is why a potato farm if you're allergic to sprays is a bad thing to live right next to because they spray a lot on potatoes to keep them healthy so once again, early in the morning, you go out and they're usually sitting on top of the leaves. So after five, six years in my garden, a few showed up. So they're fairly easy to catch and squish. However, the time consuming part is if they've already laid eggs, you have to look on the bottom of each leaf. Mm. 20 plants, 
how many leaves per plant times 20, a lot of leaves to turn over, but I did it for two years. And on the bottom of the leaf will be a little cluster of orange. They're real easy to see, tiny, tiny little um, spherical legs. Hmm. So you just rub them out, okay? So after that, knock on wood, I haven't seen any potato beetles since then. All right, that's number two. What's number three? Shall we go on to, oh, the raspberry cane borer. Now, do, did we get a picture of that? No, that wasn't on the list. Okay, that's not on the list. <laughs> that's because I've never seen the borer. Wow. Well, I'm sure I've seen it flying around. I'm guessing it's like a little fly, but I don't, I haven't looked it up. I don't know what it looks like, but it's real easy to spot the problem. Usually around now, July, okay, back up. Red raspberries are a plant that year one sets, set up a cane. Mine go about four feet high. No flowers, no raspberries, just leaves. The second year in the row, that cane, now two years old, will set the flowers and have raspberries and then die. So come, and usually it's in middle of July to middle of August. Then you cut the dead cane back down to the ground. Meanwhile, a new set has grown up next to it. So you keep this two-year cycle going. So come around now, next week or so in July, you walk down the row. It's real quick. You don't have to bend over. You don't have to squish anything. <laughs> if a borer has been flying around, the adult, she's punctured the top of the new growth, maybe, maybe four inches down from the top, laid her eggs. And somehow now around that egg or eggs is two black bands that go all around the stem and they're about maybe two inches apart. And what happens is it's cut off the flow of liquid water. And so as you walk down your four foot high row, some of the tips on the new canes will be droopy. Aha, and look down a few inches and you'll see the two black bands. You get out your shears, you cut it off just below the lower band and you put it in a bag in the trash. Do not put it in your compost heap. <laughs> Although I suspect they would die there before they hatch, but who knows? So we get rid of them. So that's an easy one to do. Snip it and put it in the trash. Now the next one, the cucumber beetle. And, and I, did I ask you for the squash bug? Because they sort of do the same thing. Now, were there, there, are there two cucumber beetles? One striped and one spotted? Yes. Yes, I thought so. Okay, here is another problem that ha has interesting um, consequences. They will attack cucumbers, the whole, the whole family. Also pumpkins and squashes and zucchini and stuff like that. I'm not sure about the watermelons, um, but that's all they eat or need to lay their eggs in. Mm -hmm. Like the monarch butterfly. Mm -hmm. You get rid of the milkweed, you're gonna get rid of, probably get rid of the monarch butterfly. Anyway, these are harder to catch because they quite often are down in the flower, which is, you know, trumpet shaped. Mm -hmm. And I read about, but I didn't have a um, dust buster, that little vacuum yeah. that runs what? On a battery, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And you keep it in your car where well, you can go out early in the morning and vacuum them up. <laughs> but I didn't have that. So for three years, they and the squash bugs this was, once again, about five years after the beginning of the garden, started to build up. And by the third year, there had become a problem. And I thought, er, how am I gonna get rid of these buggers without spraying? And then I thought, you know what? If for one year, I don't plant any of these host plants, okay. when the, whatever it is, the larvae hatch, they'll look around and they'll starve to death. So that's what I did. I gave up my pumpkins, my squash. I never grow cucumbers anyway, um, for one whole year. Hmm. Never since, knock on wood. <laughs> I'm gonna knock on wood a lot today. No more of these bugs, okay. no squash bugs, no, no, neither kind of cucumber beetle. So once again, I'm lucky in that I'm isolated. If you have someone living next door that's growing them, you're not gonna be able to get rid of them this way. Right. So get a dust buster. Hmm. All right, what's, oh yes, now the one we love. 
the Japanese beetle. Yes. And anybody that's lived here more than I lose track of time. Oh yeah, that's a great eat. Seven or eight years, nine maybe now. We never had these up here in Allegheny County because it was too cold. Yeah. So those of you that love global warming have to put up with a lot more bugs that have moved up from the south. And I jokingly say, pretty soon the kudzu will be here as well. Mm. <laughs> it's already oh, no. down. It's already in Pennsylvania. So anyway, um, so what happened was they came from the south and then they were in Wellsville and Hornell a couple, two or three years before they got up the hill. Because once again, it's colder, the higher you go. Mm -hmm. But eventually they arrived. Yeah. And this brings back a memory. I, I grew up down on Long Island after the war when they first invaded the country. And the country was also still quite hostile to Japan in the late forties, obviously. The war had just ended. And we had a local newspaper in Levittown on Long Island, and they had a cartoon strip every once a week in that paper. So did I tell you this one, Rima? Mm -hmm. I, I, oh, I didn't? No. Okay, this was, a for some reason, I don't remember any of the others, but I remember this one. And it's probably because my mother made me go out to her rose bushes with the soapy water to try and get rid of the Japanese beetles. And it was a losing battle. Mm -hmm. So the cartoon shows from the air, looking down this cute little house, in Levittown with some trees, young trees in the front. And up in the tree was this very Japanese looking Japanese beetle. Um, and he sees the guy coming with his flit can. Flit, I think was a generic name for a certain kind of spray in those days. And he yells out, air raid, air raid, air raid. And all the Jap beetles put on these gas masks. Yeah. And the guy comes out and sprays away, then goes in the house and he takes off the mask and yells, all clear. <laughs> so anyway, um, that sticks in my mind for some reason. And uh, excuse me a minute. Hi. Um, and so it reminds us that, of course the bugs can't talk. They don't have gas masks, but they can learn to be resistant. Alrighty, so um, let's see here. How to get rid of them? This is fairly easy. Um, little cottage cheese carton filled with only an inch or two of water on the bottom and a little soap to make suds. And you just, once again, on your early patrol, you walk down, they're attracted to certain things. Not everything, fortunately. For me, it's my raspberries, sometimes in the asparagus, and once in a while on the beans. Now they look like beans to me, those leaves there, sort of. Yeah. Um, and usually you can tell, because you can see on the beans anyway, chewed up. Yep. And they're usually early in the morning sitting on the top and they're this bronzy color, so the, it's shiny, the sun picks them up. Just a tap and most all of them plop into the soapy water. They like asparagus. Okay. I find I, them on my asparagus. Yes, the, I do too but more on my raspberries. Yeah. Now that brings to mind the, the little kid who will gobble up the macaroni and cheese, but really not like the spinach. They don't like everything. They're attracted to more to certain things than to others. So another way to go is, which I don't really advise, is plant, um, what do they call it? A trap crop. So they'll go to it instead of your asparagus. Oh. However, to me, that also says, anybody in the neighborhood, here's something you really like, come yes. here to eat it. So I don't do trap crops. Mm -hmm. um, so they, but you knock them into the soapy water and they drown. Well, they take a while to drown. I'm not a Jainist. I think that's the Indian yeah. religious cult that won't step on an ant. Yes. Um, and then I flush them down the toilet. Usually they're dead by then. Oh, really? Yeah, well, sometimes to save the soap, <laughs> talk about penny pinching, I leave the carton sitting out because I'll do it during the height of the season. I'll do it again in the evening. Mm. And then, you know, they're all dead and I, I flush them down the toilet. Or you could, if they're all dead, you can just dump them there on the ground, the fertilizer, you know, mm. organic matter. Um, let me think for a minute. So if you don't want to go the route of the trap crop, 
maybe you just don't want to deal with growing something they really love. And that would not include the asparagus. But I gave up my hollyhocks, partly because they had rust and I couldn't get rid of that, even though it didn't kill them. I didn't like the looks on the leaves. And the, it, and the, and the um, beetles loved them. So I just got rid of my hollyhocks. The other thing I got rid of was eggplant. And this is, you know, you need to do some soul, soul searching. Um, for years, I grew two eggplants in my garden. And when I think about it, it was mostly the challenge. Back in the days of zone four, it wasn't easy to grow eggplants here in Allegheny County. But I grew them by God, and they always attracted all sorts of bugs, flea beetles before the Japanese beetles. <clears throat> and you had to have the box ready all during June to cover them up if it got chilly at night. Mm -hmm. And then the truth be told, I don't like eggplant. Why am I doing this? Why am I growing something I really don't like to eat when it's such a nuisance? And so no more eggplant. One less thing to have to deal with um, that would attract the beetles. Uh -huh. Now I have to toss out, and once again, you can double research it, but I think uh, it's accurate. <clears throat> One way of dealing with it is um, the adults, when they mate, and then they lay their eggs, I believe in the soil in your lawn, especially if you mow a lawn, mm -hmm. not so much out in the hay field, I don't think. Um, then it becomes a grub and lives there over the fall and the winter and the spring to hatch out into the adult beetle. You know, one of those creatures that goes through three or four cycles, all very different. So milky spore disease, I think is a fungus that will kill the grub if you spray your lawn. However, hmm. supposedly you do it once and it, it reproduces the milky spore and lasts. However, I think we're still too cold here in Allegheny County for the milky spore to last over the winter. So that would mean redoing it and it's pretty expensive, I'm guessing, every spring. Um, Okay, I suppose uh, off the top of my head, we're, we're going to talk about this next month when we talk about lawns. Just grow a flowery meadow, and I suspect, although research it, that you won't have as many um, Japanese beetle grubs in a meadow with high grass. Huh. I think they like the lawn. Anyway, okay. Um, very quickly. You probably didn't get it. Did I ask for aphids? I don't think I probably did. Mm -hmm. No. This is it. Okay. I never had trouble with aphids, but some people do. And a real simple solution, you get your hose out and hopefully you have enough pressure so that, you know, the water doesn't come out like this. And you put it on full blast and you just blow them out of the trees. And the aphids, aphids um, seem dumb enough. They don't figure out how to get back up. So once you knock them off... And it's usually the new growth, like on my cherry tree, it was where the new leaves were coming out. Um, and once you knocked them off with the water spray, that was it. Huh. So you could try that. You know, we've um, had trouble with aphids with our green pepper plants. Oh. And all we did, they were growing in our greenhouse. We just oh. put them outside and we actually watched ants come and clean them up. Ah. Which is really great. Did they really? Oh, yes. They're gone now. The aphids, their eggs, everything. The ants ate everything. All right. I'm going to go out on a branch here. <laughs> Don't cut it off. Okay. Um, that that was a coincidence because usually if you do the research, ants um, heard the aphids because aphids make something we call honeydew, a sweet, sticky, whatever, oh. and the ants eat it. And so um, you could just, and it might have been a coincidence that they disappeared. Oh. But you check that out. Okay. All right. And once again, I'm sure there are different species of aphids yeah. as there oh. are ants. And so maybe this particular type of ant did kill them. But usually it's the other way around. Well, if they rounded them up and took them somewhere else, that's fine. Oh, I don't know if they that do works that. Too. Maybe. Well, <laughs> it's there's like nothing the, on the plants. Like the leaf cutter plant. There's nothing on the plants this yeah. year and nothing last year. Oh, good. I saw it last year too. Okay. Because I was going to go out with the soapy water and clean each Yeah. Leaf. Oh, what a pain. Yeah. But try, I didn't need if to. they're sturdy, try a blast of water. 
ants and leaf cutter ants. It reminds me when Jordan was 10, we went on a trip and we were out west to the Karchner Caverns and we were waiting to go on the tour. And they have, you know, in the state parks, concrete sidewalks about five feet wide. Somebody had dropped a triangular potato chip, Pringles or something. Three ants had each gotten hold of one corner and they were bringing it back to wherever they were going. But it was like they couldn't decide who was the boss. So instead of going in a straight line to their nest, they were zigzagging down the path as each ant tried to take control of the lead. It was just hysterical. To the one. But they got there anyway. Okay. We do have pictures of slugs and snails, do we not? No. Oh, no. No. Oh. Remember, you said everybody knows. Everybody what they look knows like. what they look like. All right. So we don't need pictures of them. Okay. Um, it seems that the more <laughs> the downside of mulching is the more organic matter you have in your garden, the more attractive that will be to things like slugs and snails. In my experience, the snails, which fortunately here are only about a quarter inch in diameter, pretty small. Mm -hmm. And they seem to come like the 17 year locusts in cycles. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen a lot of snails in a long time, but 12 years ago, I think if we did what the Chinese do and name years, we, we'd call it the year of the snail. Um, and that's when I found my sawdust trick, but we'll get to that in a minute. Um, and the slugs seem to be the small gray ones, about what, quarter inch, half inch? I don't have a lot of those, fortunately, because they're a nuisance. But come June, usually, and I haven't seen many this year, so I don't know because it's dry, yeah. but they get to be two or three inches and they're reddish brown. Yep. Scissors, guys. That's the quickest way. Once again, early in the morning or in the evening, just before dark, you just take your walk with your scissors, snip them in half. Oh. They do not regenerate into two. <laughs> okay, <laughs> just cut them in half um, and leave them to dissolve into the soil. And I have discovered every now and again, there'll be a few on my, um, that come across the gravel onto my stone pathway. So in the morning, and it's just getting light, they're still there. They haven't crept away to hide for the day. If you snip one right there, Within the next hour, there'll be one or two to come, I guess, eat them up. So you got two more. Um, <laughs> I'm not a Janist. I'm heartless as far as some things go. And slugs fall into that category. Um, there's the old beer trick. I don't drink beer. So I don't do that. But you can take a cabbage leaf, rhubarb leaf, a board and put it down where they like to be, like the potatoes and the beans for me. Is, what about you? The slugs, what do they go after? Lettuce. Mm, yeah, lettuce, I was just gonna say the lettuce. Certain kinds the of kale, lettuce. Okay. Um, and then once again, they munch all night long, more or less. And then come dawn, they'll go under the dark, cool place, damp for the day. So all you do is you flip up the board, the leaf of lettuce and stomp on them or cut them in half or whatever. So they're not really that hard to get rid of. Now, oh, and the other thing is, and this is this is one of those discoveries which you could put into a whole, um, an old wives tale if it only happened once, but it's happened for 15, um, 12 or 13 years now. So now I say there's some scientific reason behind it, but I discovered it by a fluke. Um, I had always gone in June, around the middle of June, to a nearby, uh, um, I'm going to say lumber yard, but that's not true. A lumber mill oh, yeah. to where they get, bring the trees in and cut them up into mm -hmm, boards mm -hmm. and get my sawdust for the garden. And I, why I did that is I plant my potatoes shallow and close. So there's not enough soil to hill them up because you have to keep, the potatoes keep growing closer to the top of the soil up the stem. So as the summer progresses, they'll poke out and turn green and then you won't want to eat them because the green is poisonous. Um, so you hill them up. So since I didn't have enough soil to do that and usually not enough leaves left over from the fall, I would go and get whatever, 15 boxes of sawdust and in middle of June, sprinkle on say two inches of sawdust over my potato row. Well, one year I had a box left and this was 12 years ago, the year of the snail. And I had one box left. And I grow my butternut squash 
in my pumpkin out on top of my old compost heap from the year before, about four or five feet apart. And in early June, because I put, I start them early and put them out, they probably took up maybe 18 inches of space in their eventual hill as they grow and vine. And of course, the year of the snail, I'd probably pick off these little snails, maybe 12 or so on each plant. So I had one box left. So I just sprinkled around the one thinking, not thinking anything about snails, but thinking about, well, I'll mulch around this and then the stuff from the compost heap will grow up and be a nuisance. And so it was probably a half inch deep, not very deep, but all around. Next morning, 12 snails or so on the unsawdusted plant and only one on the sawdusted one, I thought. That's interesting. So since then, what I have done is, I think snails in particular, maybe more than the slugs, come in from the lawn or the field, oh, yeah. which borders my garden on one side. And they like certain things like lettuce, um, green beans maybe. And they do bit. like kale. Kale, well, I didn't grow kale in those days, but my daughter does now. So I would get some extra sawdust and I made maybe eight inch wide. Remember that trench with sand around my garden? Mm -hmm. so, uh, so on the south side of the garden, which in those days was about um, 30 feet long, facing the field, the lawn in the field, I just would sprinkle a very thin, half inch at the most, layer of sawdust. And then I'd put it around my pumpkins and along the beans and the lettuce. And that deters them. It sure does. I really have very little problems with snails and not too much with, with slugs. And what I think it is, they're all slimy and, and soft bellied. They don't like the rough um, sawdust. Yeah. Would you want to put an, uh, you know, a bunch of a tablespoon of sawdust in, in your shoes with bare feet and walk around all day? I don't think so. How far out? So, so you've got, say, um, you said a squash plant. Mm -hmm. So from the center of the plant, how far out do you put the sawdust? Uh, um, in the beginning, because later on the plant gets tougher and they don't seem to be around. The snails don't seem to be around much later. They like yeah. so. Let's say if you do this in middle of June and the plant is taking up this much space, what eighteen inches in diameter, I would go another foot and a half out. Okay, give it a try. I mean, for me, it has worked. All righty, um, bum bum. Moving on. Oh, one other thing. There is a um, a substance out there. One of the brand names is Sluggo, and I don't know if it has one or two G's. Now it's kind of expensive and it's granular, but it's been designed by the chemists, who can be quite brilliant at times, um, just to kill snails and slugs. Yeah. Your cat can eat it. I could eat it, I suppose. The birds can eat it, and it doesn't affect them, mm -hmm. from what I've read. Mm -hmm. And I've read it in several places from reliable resources, not from grandma's backyard ideas. Um, so when you get your sawdust, do you pay for it? Yes, but not, uh, well, I, I bartered. This so, year it was peach jam. <laughs> so can you get it other, where, can you, how, what, what places can you get sawdust? Okay. Um, Shall we do this on the air or should we wait till we're done here? You. Might as well wait because it's going to be local. Okay, it's local. We'll wait. Sorry, guys. You can phone me at home if you want to know the secret. But you can find a place. But I'll tell you, remind me at the end. Okay, Gina, I'll have to leave okay. right. Minutes. Okay. Um, let's see. All right. Moving on to the same topic, but different ways. Um, we will have a whole topic in a couple of weeks on companion plants. So we're not going to go into great detail here. So once again, if you're really curious about this and want to go in that direction, you can do your own research at this point. But it's obvious that some plants will attract certain bugs and some will repel them. So if you find one that is reliably, um, in other words, like 
the Cornell Cooperative Extension um, website or whatever for this topic. They've done tons of research. They should know what they're talking about. Um, so if you need some, uh, a plant that will deter, plant some next to your lettuce. And if it's close enough, it probably will work. I have to go. Okay. Um, a, a more recent alternative, which can be expensive, and if you have a, on a windy hill, a bit of a nuisance, but you can use row covers. Once again, insects, bugs, have a certain season for doing their damage. So for instance, with broccoli, it's, Regina, give me a call then. Okay, thank All you. All right. Um, it's that white cabbage moth that shows up just mm. around the, I, when Jordan lived with me that summer when he was six, and we were talking a lot about this, and he was helping in the garden, I had mentioned the white cabbage moth, which came from England, I believe, or Europe, um, and has become a pest here in not just broccoli, but that whole family, which is probably kale as well. And so it might not be snails or slugs unless you've seen them. It might be the little green worms from the moth that's making those holes. Oh, maybe. Yeah. So many, but there, um, so, and I always put my broccoli out about the third week in April. And so I had done that in the, in the afternoon. The next day, Jordan comes running in the house. He said, Grandma, you were right. And I said, yeah, I'm often right. What about? <laughs> he said, well, you put the broccoli out yesterday and that cabbage moth has shown up. <laughs> he saw the white cabbage moth floating around. So anyway, um, <laughs> row covers are great if, if you're on a windy hill, you stake them down really well because otherwise they'll blow away and you'll have a parachute going over the hill. Um, you have to make sure they're sealed all the way around because all you, you know how it is. One little hole in your screen and that damn mosquito gets in, right? <laughs> There's more of them than us. They'll find the spot. So set it up properly and at the proper time. Now, if for some reason you're using row covers for your strawberries, for instance, you might want to get a crop two weeks early, especially if you're selling. You know, you can always get more money for the very first strawberries. Mm -hmm. Well, if you put row covers on and leave them on, the bees are not going to get in to pollinate and you're not going to have any strawberries. So same thing if you use the dome parachute type row covers for your um, squash cucumbers, et cetera, for the beetle. Well, they need to be pollinated by the bees or, or something, flies, bees, whatever. Um, <clears throat> so if you haven't totally covered the whole time, you're not gonna get anything <laughs> except leaves, okay? So you have to know what you're doing. However, they're very effective. If, if you're willing to spend the money, install them correctly at the correct time. Otherwise you'll be out there with a paintbrush <laughs> what the bees do for nothing. All righty, row covers. Oh, timing. How are we doing on time? Uh, what time is it? It's 12.27. Oh, well, we're just going to run a little late this time, right? We can do that, right? Okay. Um, timing. If you, when your crop is vulnerable to this particular insect, whether it's when it's laid its eggs that does the damage or it's adult is eating your leaves. Um, once again, those bugs usually aren't there all summer long. They have a cycle. So if you plant time you're planting to miss their cycle, you'll be home free. Now, once again, I may get this mixed up. So you should double check it. Carrots. I usually have no problems with my carrots, but every once in a while, usually in the top inch or so, when I harvest them, there'll be little tunnels, dark brown, blackish tunnels running around in the top of the carrot. I think that's due to the rust, carrot rust fly, mm. which has laid its eggs, and those are the larvae. Well, so you cut the top off and you lose some of your carrot crop. However, as I recall, the ones I plant in the middle of summer, which by the way is what we're gonna be talking about next time, the second harvest, what you plant in the middle of July for the fall. I don't think those carrots ever had the problem. 
The reason being, whoever laid those eggs had were long gone. Now, there's several things that have cycles like that. I'm just not familiar with them. So once again, you need to do some research. This is not a free lunch, guys. I mean, it's free, but you have to do some work as well. <clears throat> and my final suggestion is just don't grow things that are a real problem. Now, I'll give, I gave up my eggplant, which I didn't care that much about, but I do love my lettuce. However, I grow seven different kinds in a row. Um, the dark red purple ones, the pale yellow green ones, the dark. Now, the only thing that the snails or, and or the slugs seem to bother is the butter crunch. Oh. They leave the cost alone. They leave the Merlot alone. They leave the, the um, black seeded Simpson alone. So I suppose, although I love butter crunch, it's one of the best as far as I'm going to, I could just give up growing that particular variety. Hmm. So that's a decision you guys have to make for yourself. Let's see. Do I have anything more before we move on briefly to watering? Okay, just a finishing up thought. Once again, there's more of them than us, but we're smart. You have to be observant. You know that old saying? Um, what is the saying? Hmm. Something about nipping in the bud. There's another one about um, one year's weeding, seven years seed. Uh, no, one year's seeding, seven years weeding. So if you do your daily walk through the garden, you observe things. Mm -hmm. If nothing's happening, wonderful. You've had a beautiful early morning walk in the garden. Bring your cup of coffee with you while you do it. Listen to NPR while you're doing it, but do it. And then you have to be persistent. You have to yes. get kind of stubborn. I'm sorry, guys. It's not all peace and harmony out there. Tooth and nail. Who's that 18th century? Somebody oh, or yeah. other, you know. Nature. Na yeah. Raw and tooth and claw. Yeah. It's not really a friendly place out there. It's eat and live or die. So anyway, you have to be persistent. You go on patrol. So I'm thinking you can approach it two ways. You can do it as a Zen exercise. <laughs> you empty the mind except for the focus of what you're looking for. Or you can maybe get some martial music. I grew up in the Marine Corps. So for me, it would be the halls of Montezuma. <laughs> you put your headphones on and you become Earl Flynn maybe you want a scarf and helmet as well just get into it right your soapy water instead of your machine gun and take them out so anyway um, I, as I got into this talk I thought we could do it kind of funny you know we don't have to do it so serious however it is serious think about the history of Ireland in the 18 whatever oh, it was yeah. the 40s that was blight on the potatoes, yeah. um, which we, by the way, are now having a problem with our tomatoes with blight. Does anybody that's grown tomatoes in the last three, four years know? Mm -hmm. But the Irish, because so many were poor and because potatoes are so productive and have a, I mean, you can almost eat potatoes and I think, is it iron that they don't have? But they, potatoes are a pretty well-rounded nutrition yeah, for us. And so what did they say? The average Irishman ate 12 potatoes, 12 pounds of potatoes a day. Is that possible? Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And when the blight swept through, about a third of the population, about one and a half million people died. Yeah. Yeah, it was awful. And another third emigrated, you know, to Canada, to America, mm -hmm. elsewhere. So that's another problem with um, monoculture. But, you know, the bugs, they're potentially um, lethal for humanity. So you do have to keep on top of it. Um, and there's more than one way of doing it. All righty. We're running over time, but um, we got started a little late. And I think this is important. I'll try and do it quickly. Watering. We've hit a dry spell here in the end of June. So... Normally, this part of Allegheny County gets almost 40 inches of rain a year, mm -hmm. and it's usually spread 
more or less throughout the year. We do tend to have drier Septembers and Octobers, at least in the past. All of that with global warming is changing. We've become much warmer and definitely much more humid. And our rain cycles, well, you always had some years that were dry and some that were over wet, but when the air is warmer, and remember three fourths of our earth is water, the ocean, warmer water evaporates more. So you have more humidity and moisture in the air. Mm. And so I've lived in Allegheny County long enough to remember the, the cooler, but definitely drier air that we had here in the summer. And now we have a lot of humid days. And it seems like when it rains, <clears throat> what was that old? When it rains, it pours, really pours. Um, okay. For gardeners, we need, starting whenever you garden, let's say the middle of April through the end of October, the ideal would be one inch of rain a year, no, one inch of <laughs> rain a week for your garden. And if you don't get it from Lost Sky, you need to do some extra watering. So here's how we do it. One inch, okay. Yeah. You've all seen it. You're driving home from work. Somebody's gotten out of work a little earlier than you, and it's usually a guy. And there he is out on his lawn with his hose sprinkling. 15 minutes, 10 minutes before dinner, right? <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> Don't do it. Sprinkling does more harm than good. If anything, it creates a thin, thin, thin layer on the top that is moist. So the roots will grow there instead of going deep and therefore be much more susceptible to drought. What you want to do is when you water, soak it so it goes down into the soil and not just a thin layer on top. <clears throat> so how do you soak it? Well, there are quite a few ways. Um, a hose and there, there are, a, I think of them basically as two types of sprinklers, the one that goes around and around and around. But <laughs> Since most of us don't plant round gardens, mm -hmm. there's always those corners that don't get it. So in a sense, the, the one that's like, what would you say? And it just goes back and forth in a rectangle. Right. And since most of us grow in rectangles or squares, that's better suited. Okay. Um, someday when I have more time, I'll talk about Texas versus New Mexico. And when you're driving across the state line at night, what happens? with their watering systems and keep you in suspense. <laughs> All righty. Um, then there are, but when you do that, um, you're, um, once again, Regina has left, so she won't call me on it. I don't know what percent, but you lose a certain percent to evaporation. So if you're paying for your water, like we all do one way or the other, um, you want to take that into consideration. Um, so a soca hose makes better sense. And you know what they are? They're sort of like canvas, I think. And um, the water, and you lay them along the row and then you turn on your hose and they just slowly soak into the ground. Mm -hmm. It'll take a little longer because it's a slower you know, production and absorbing. Um, now a cheap way to do that, my garden tends to be on a one degree slope. So let me think. So it's like six inches lower, 50 feet down from the top, six inches, one degree. So the water is not gonna rush down, but if you make a slight trench on either side of your rows, this takes more time. You have to every half hour run out, but you start, you just lay the hose, no nozzle, very slow trickle at the top end mm -hmm. of the garden. And it will slowly trickle down the trench to the foot of the garden might take a half hour. So if you have 10 rows, you know, you can do half of them one day, half the next day or something. That's another way to do it. Mm, let's see. And the theory is you should water in the morning so that the leaves have a chance to dry off at night to reduce the possibility of certain fungal diseases. However, almost every night has dew. So I'm not quite sure where that's coming from. Oh, 
and I think somebody mentioned this last time, certain plants love warm soil, like your tomatoes, oh, yeah. your peppers, your pumpkins, your watermelons, your lima beans. So as I don't know about people in town, but my well water is probably 50 degrees, I'm guessing. Yeah, hers is really cold. So what I do in that case, and once again, I don't have 100 tomato plants. Um, I get out, say, six buckets. If I have you know, one pumpkin, one squash, two tomatoes, a row of lima beans, six buckets, and I fill them up in the morning and let them mm -hmm. sit out all day. And by late in the day, they've warmed up. And then I just carry them and slowly pour them mm -hmm. around those heat-loving warm soil loving plants let me see if that's it. so oh and finally i tried this but for me it was more of a nuisance than it was worth because usually you know we don't live in the southwest so usually we have enough rain and usually just a regular what i talked about works but i got carried away and i got some rain barrels now once again i tried to do the math over again, and then I said, "Hooey." <laughs> um, in other words, convert a gallon of water to so many square inches, because if you need an inch of rain, you would have to know how big a garden you have, then how many gallons are in the rain barrel, and therefore how many square feet in your garden that rain barrel, if it was full, would water. A, a very general rule of thumb would be a 50 gallon barrel, which is what most of them I think are, will cover about 300 square feet an inch. So that's assuming you're gonna have a rainstorm that not only do you get your inch in your garden, but the roof has filled up your rain barrel. And so that's another math. This is all sixth grade math, folks. You can do it. Mm -hmm. You figure out the square foot of your roof where the gutter comes down and in, in, into your rain barrel and um, figure it out. <laughs> and of course your rain barrel has to be uphill from your garden. Mm -hmm. Otherwise it's not gonna work. Yep. So lots of fun and games. Next time, I can't believe it's the middle of July. We're halfway through this series about, and we're gonna talk about the second harvest because so many people, you've seen it, eager beavers. In May, come the middle of July, their garden is a wreck. <coughs> Weeds are head high. Nothing's being replanted. So we'll talk about what to do with all that space after your early crops are gone. All right, okay. super. All righty.